Well, well, welcome, David, to LTAD Chat. This is the short version of LTAD Chat, uh, where we use a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, I think we have three pictures this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about the adolescent growth spurt and injury risk. Um, so David is a sports scientist at AFC Bournemouth Academy and also a PhD student at uh, Bath University, where he works with uh, very closely with one of my great friends and colleagues, uh, Dr. Sean Cumming, um, again, around this topic of the adolescent growth spurt and how it's impacting health performance and injury risk um, in youth. So David's gonna talk to us about a recent study uh, that he's published as part of his PhD. And before we dive into that, um, we're just gonna kind of do an overview of the adolescent growth spurt. Um, obviously, it's a main part of his methodology um, so just using this slide of our classic uh, growth velocity curve and growth rates as, it, as youngsters grow and mature. Um, and again, I have this blue box around the boys because, um, correct me if I'm wrong, David, but I think most, if not all, of the research in this area has been done on adolescent boys. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So let, let's just kind of walk through the growth spurt. And let's talk about you know, some of the methodologies that you use as a sports scientist and a researcher um, to assess growth and maturation during the growth spurt. Yeah, so um, firstly, thank you for having me on. It's a real pleasure to be back on the LTAD chat again, um, speaking about a topic that I'm really passionate about, and I know you are as well. Um, so firstly, with regards to my sort of own um, sample as you will within the academy so with boys we're seeing a slightly different timing of the adolescent growth spurt to girls so if you're working with females or in a di in a different population it's important to take that into consideration um, when transferring from girls to boys so you can see there that the timing of peak height velocity and the subsequent other markers of growth are slightly different between those two um, in terms of by two years approximately um, the main way that we track growth within uh, the academy, but also through my PhD studies, is measuring changes in height ac across a given time period. So essentially, the change in stature um, between two measurement points divided by that time between those two measurement points in years, uh, that gives us a really good indication. And that's also what is demonstrated over there on the graph on the left, gives you an indication of how fast a adolescent boy or girl is growing. And what we generally see is that there is a peak in that growth spurt at around 13.8 years old in an average population. But actually there's a really high variability in that as well. And that sort of comes across to that figure on the right, which sort of encompasses maturation where you have boys which are um, average mature, so would look similar to that graph that's represented there but also late maturers take a little bit longer to physically develop. And also those boys which are in advance, which um, develop earlier than their counterparts. And this means that we also take sort of um, maturation into account alongside that to understand firstly, whether a player is early on time or late. So are they developing ahead of normal population or behind of normal population? but also so what phase of the growth spurt they're in. So if you look at the diagram, so previous to the blue box on the boys diagram, that's what we'd classify as pre-peak height velocity. Once they then enter that rapid period of growth, where the spurt's increasing exactly where your marker's going, that's then the peak height velocity period, down to the end where that deceleration mark is, and then that's the post-peak height velocity period. So from de that deceleration arrow down to the termination of growth, that's post and that will come up again in the study that we'll talk about in a second. So we in the academy combine those two. So understanding the growth rate, which is on the left and how fast an individual grows, but also whether they're early on time and late or pre that growth spurt in that growth spurt and post that growth spurt. Yeah. Just for clarification, as we get to the next slide into your study, you also use this term circa PhD. Yeah. 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 Yes. And that's representing, you know, when they're in the midst of yeah. that of that spurt, so the, the central part of that spurt there, yeah. yeah so so uh, let's go into the study. Um, 
you know, great title, uh, you know, grow, grow, growing pains, right? Yeah. Um, and part of that pain also is this risk for injury. Um, yeah. So, so, was... let's, so let's, walk, let's walk through the study. Yeah. So um, essentially what I, I did was I took two seasons worth of retrospective data within our academy. So that's um, sort of secondary data. So old data and compared that to the amount of minutes and the number of injuries and the growth, the maturation data within those players. So we, we took account for how often the players were playing in matches. So in terms of ex their exposure and then try to understand whether being pre that growth spurt, during that growth spurt or post that growth spurt would be related to the number of injuries. So that's how you, that's injury incidents. So that's just a pure number, but also injury burden. So injury burden is an indication of the severity of injuries in addition. So for example, um, if you have two injuries of five days, that would be an incidence of two but two multiplied by five would give you a burden of 10. Whereas you could have one injury of 10 days, which would be an injury incidence of one, but a burden of 10 days. So it sort of accounts for those injuries, which are um, sort of leading to the players missing more time away from training and matches. Um, so sort of a secondary outcome as, as you'd say. Um, then we also looked at whether a player being advanced or early mature had an effect on injury risk and whether they were on time, so an average mature or a late mature, would have an effect on the injury risk on the players. So on the graph on the right there that you've been highlighting, a risk ratio of one means that there is no change in injury risk. So in each of the comparisons, so the top comparison, pre-peak height velocity was used as sort of the reference category, and we were comparing against that for the other groups. And the same for on-time maturers of the reference category in the section below. In, in the top graph, what we see is compared to pre-peak height velocity, there's a dramatic increase in the number of injuries, so injury incidents, so your sort of light red one there, and then also injury burden, the time missed away from training during peak height velocity. So this to us is confirming some previous research that I know we'll go on to talk about in, in a minute. But highlighting that period of the growth spurt as an increased risk for our players and also leading to um, increased time away from training and I believe um, that the burden factor there there's 225 percent greater likelihood of missing training days when in circuit peak high velocity so that's a really substantial change from pre-PHV and then in the post PHV category, what we see is sort of a reduced risk compared to circa, but relatively the same in terms of pre peak height velocity. So the injury incidence, so the numbers don't significantly change, and the injury burden was slightly higher. We believe that that was not associated to um, the growth spurt, but more associated to the. Um, the injury likelihoods of older players in in that they are training more intensely and playing more intense matches but also that they could be prone to um long like greater severity long-term injuries such as aco injuries or hamstring ruptures and those sort of things that we see that become more often as we get towards adulthood um, so that's probably where we saw those increases in severity in terms of maturity timing, so whether someone was early on time and late, as you can see on that graph, there's no real trends or differences between the groups. Um, and we actually found that there was no significant difference across all of those. You could potentially suggest that there is a slightly lower injury incidence there um, for the late maturers, but again, not significant. And I think that this is mainly due to the particular environment of our football club. So there's some research to suggest in other environments that the maturity timing might affect um, injury incidence and injury burden. Um, but in our environment, we have quite a, a fluid environment where players will move between categories and the training is very individualized. So I believe that that approach has sort of mitigated those risks and we're not exposing players to um, unnecessarily high training loads or likelihood of injury in that situation.
Yeah, which might not be the case in other environments. Exactly. So, yeah. so I think that's very case specific, that sort of maturity timing. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if you have anything else to add to the slide, but I think that flows real nicely into comparing what you found, you yeah. know, to, to what others have found as well. Because again, oftentimes we have, you know, these late matures who may be at an increased risk of of injury. And again, that may be because of the environment and not taking into consideration, um, you know, growth and maturation as your club is doing. So do you just, yeah. you, you just want to kind of speak to, you know, comparing your study, which is on this line right here to maybe yeah. some of the other published research. And again, yeah. this is, you know, this is a relatively low number of studies for comparison. Um, but I just want to make the point that, you know, with your work and some of the other work coming out of the Aspire Academy, um, and as you know, Mandy Johnson has been leading these efforts all the way back to 2010, um, in terms of, in terms of publication, um, this is certainly becoming a recognized area of study and kind of a hot topic right now, as it should be. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's an understanding that probably Mandy first sort of publicized and sort of um, published data on in back in 2010 that's growing and growing and I know that there's other PhD students around the world that are doing a very similar topic to I am and publishing um, probably in the near future very similar res results and also different findings in different situations. So Mandy's original study, so that's that top one, Johnson 2010, um, sort of highlighted that there could be this period of increased risk when looking at skeletal maturation, um, which sort of laid the foundations for her interest and also some of the future studies that we'll see on this table, but also um, definitely go and look at her research gate because she's got some excellent work out there in this topic area. The next studies were sort of a, um, the, I, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, Van der Sluis, I always say, um, but the 2015-2016 studies in a Dutch academy, um, this would, so that line there is two studies combined, and they're two really key findings. I believe the first one was the similar to the findings that I spoke about on the previous page, which suggested that the period of peak height velocity was at a period of increased risk for their players within their academy and related to more days missed again, so that injury burden variable. The other really interesting thing about this study is they split their injuries into acute and overuse as well. Um, this then led them to a, a secondary study which analyzed whether maturity timing, so whether you're a later maturer or an earlier maturer, would affect those um, injury variables. And what they found was the later maturers were more at risk of overuse injuries. And this original finding when I read the study and also speaking to some colleagues is, is a really lo logical finding in that if you have two players that are exposed to the same training and match play, that if one is less physically developed than a later maturer, they could be at a greater risk of overuse injury because if you think about their capacities of being able to perform that training, if it's proportionally higher than what they're able to do, for that later mature, that would then be associated with increased risk. Um, the next study, again, really good study by Bolt. He looked at different periods. Um, so he split peak height velocity using the maturity offset method, and he split that into different periods to identify where the greatest risk occurred. So in the previous study that I spoke about, they looked at one year around peak height velocity. Um, in Bolt study, he split it into six month periods. So he had um, pre peak height velocity, um, the six months in peak height velocity, six months before, six months after, and then post. And he actually found that the six months after peak height velocity are where he saw the greatest um, injury incidents. And I believe that he also had some injury burden measures in there as well. Um, that study and those findings obviously reflect similarly to. Uh, the previous study and my own study that found that we've got this period of risk around adolescence, but also that potentially it's that time between peak height velocity and peak weight velocity, where there's changes in the body happening from sort of um, two, two different perspectives there. So you're seeing changes in height, so stature, you're 
getting taller, your um, limbs are getting longer and that sort of thing. But also you're seeing a change in muscle mass and strength that's occurring in delay of those changes. And it could be the disparity between those or could be the peak weight velocity and the increased um, momentum and the forces that are acting on the body through having more weight and more musculature that could be affecting those injury risks. And that's something that we are, are yet to fully understand. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up, David, because real interesting, right? We have a change in bone and, yeah. and you know, the, the linear dimension of bone, but also the architectural aspects of the bone. And then we yeah. have this very rapid change in muscle mass, as you said, with peak weight velocity, follow, you know, largely due to changes in muscle mass. And then, you know, what's going on at that musculoskeletal tendon unit? Yeah, um, you know, re real, really key here um, as, as we talk about the adolescent growth spurt and injury risk. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that up with the peak weight velocity aspect of that study. Yeah. And then um, just below that uh, central black line that you've got there in your table, we've got two uh, good studies that have looked more in depth at um, the growth rate and how that might be associated with injuries. So in that Kemper study, what they did was they divided the injured players versus the non-injured players and split them into two groups. Um, this then led them to doing a comparison between the groups and they found that in the injured players they had a significantly higher rate of growth over that season and their rate of growth was 7.2 centimeters per year which um, you put in there as 0.6 centimeters per month um, which we would class as sort of above those prepubescent growth rates that we see of about five or six but not quite as um, peak as you might see in some children of, of 10, 11, 12 centimeters. So sort of a, um, an indicator of where they might be going into a period of um, rapid growth. Um, the thing that I would comment on that though, is with that study, by using a cutoff value, it doesn't give us an indication of whether you're getting you're more at risk of injury at 7.3 centimeters per year or 7.1 centimeters per year. And that difference might be very small. Whereas um, a player growing at 12 centimeters per year is that at greater risk than someone who's growing at 7.5, which is just above that cutoff value. Um, but still necessarily a good finding and a good important thing for practitioners to consider in terms of growth rate and having multiple indicators of when the growth spurt is occurring. And then uh, a really recent study uh, by Wick, who I believe is doing his PhD in this area at the Aspire Academy, um, which found that uh, a growth rate in stature and leg length was an increased risk of bone injuries, but also growth plate injuries. So they have a bigger data set there at Aspire and they could look across multiple different sports at their youth athletes and can therefore make those distinctions between the different types of injuries and how they might occur at different periods in the growth spurt. And I think that's um, another really key point um, that we always think that peak height velocity is the period where players are going to get injured. But actually, Amanda Johnson has said to me previously, if the growth in the tissues is peaking at different periods in different tissues, Therefore, timing of that risk is going to be different for those different tissues. Um, just as an example, we see severs occurring at more at 11 and 12 in youth football, male football players. And that is probably in line with when the growth in the foot is happening, which is happening pre-peak high velocity. Um, so again, a really sort of uh, a good finding there that it's injury dependent, but also growth dependent on on the tissue that's growing yeah good review here david um so as we as we finish up how about practical implications of this work like what advice do you have for coaches and other practitioners so if we have this growing evidence that the growth spurt and maybe different uh phases of the spurt um are related to injury risk um, what kind of modifications may we be making to our training plans? Yeah, so there's a variety of things that you can do. 
and depending on the resources and the time available to you you can take which ones you think are going to fit within your program and i guess as we've mentioned with a few of these different aspects it's sort of program specific um the first recommendation that i would make is tracking the growth spurt so tracking growth by for understanding how much a players or youths growing between two time periods, but also understanding maturity um, through um, understanding when you think that growth spurt is going to occur. Because the main issue with measuring growth rate is that if you take a three month measurement of um, stature change between those three months, you know the risk in those three months, but that's already passed and that's already happened. So understanding if the growth spurt is around the corner is another key element to that. Um, but then once you have that is sort of understanding and that measurement of your players and, or of your children, you, you then need to build upon that and understand the literature that we've, you've really nicely summarized here, at what could potentially be classed as someone that is more at risk or less at risk. So in terms of peak height velocity, I would probably go with a more conservative route than Bolt went with and say, either if you're using the maturity offset method, the year of peak height velocity, or if you're using the Camus Roche method um, from 85 to 95% as classifying that as within peak height velocity. I would then also use an indication of growth rate. So um, the 0.6 value there from the Kemper study, despite the limitations of that, is probably a, quite a good uh, figure to use as it will differentiate between someone who's going through a period of rapid growth and normal childhood growth um, as a, a separating value, but just use your sort of own understanding that if somebody is 7.19, that actually they're probably just as risk at risk as somebody who's 7.3. And then again, we've seen really high growth rates in our situation. And I'd imagine that if you're growing at an extreme value of uh, 12 or 13, which is above what we might see in um, some of those um, average figures of the growth spurt, that they're even at even greater risk than those players. Then in terms of adapting what you're doing in terms of training and match play, the first thing is thinking about those individual differences so if you've got somebody who you think is regularly breaking down due to growth related injuries they're in their growth spurt it might be time to reduce how much they're doing in terms of volume but also intensity of the movement the other thing that i would recommend is supplementing your program with exercises which are going to make them more robust against injuries but without increasing their training load and their training volume so a good example that we've applied in my own context is we reduce the training in some aspects and then those players which are, are at risk they do additional sort of balance coordination and landing mechanics work and those are the exercises that we think if they can learn how to run with better coordination be able to balance and not fall over with their new growing bodies and also land with appropriate technique that's going to lead us to less injuries than if they just played their sport for an additional 15 minutes. So that's the trade-off that we've made and had some success with in the academy. So, so two follow-ups to this, um, you know, you mentioned the balance coordination landing, and we've had this conversation offline several times about adolescent awkwardness. Yeah. You know, again, it's, it's not well studied, um, but we know it when we see it. So yeah. a question to you is, what do you, what do you think the general percentage is, you know, in, in, in your academy? Like if you just have to ballpark it and say, of all the boys who come through, I'm going to say 10% is, or 20% would be what I would call you know, adolescent awkwardness. And obviously this kind of fits into the risk of injury as well, doesn't it? Um, you know, it's not only the, the growing dimensions of the body, but it's the ability to coordinate and react and decelerate and, you know, all of these things that can place them at risk of injury as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a really difficult question in terms of percentage. I'd probably say between 10 to 20% of players have it to an extreme point where 
as a sports scientist, I'm concerned about their movement qualities, but also we're getting feedback from the technical coaching staff that players are really struggling and they think it is probably an adolescent awkwardness or a coordination problem that they're having issues with. So that's some severe cases that would probably make 10 to 20%. I would also say on top of that, you're seeing a proportion of um, players that are having that we're probably seeing deficits in terms of physical performance scores during that time. Um, so in peak height velocity, um, it's not always exactly in, in line with peak height velocity, but during that period of a year around that area, you're seeing that most players will have a period where they have a, 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 at least a dip or a slowing in their development in terms of physical performance measures. And I think that's partly due to adolescent awkwardness and their changing bodies and then also partly due to the number of times that we measure and some people have off days but it's just something to consider that just because somebody's got slightly slower or worse at jumping that that's not them going downhill it could just be a temporary thing related to adolescent awkwardness yeah and the the second uh question that i have uh off of that is strength training so you you know you talked about balance coordination jumping landing and kind of when i hear jumping and landing i think of plyometrics a bit yeah um you know and i've heard you know some of the premier league academy coaches say they may reduce plyometric activity at that time because of the stress that it may place on now obviously that's referring more to higher intensity plyometrics as well um, but the question is what about strength training and again we need to think about this age group as well you know because what what is their training age in reference to strength training and obviously in your environment you guys do a fabulous job with foundational training and and whatnot but you know there might be a lot of coaches or parents who listen to this and they have a boy who's 12 13 14 years of age and they've never done resistance training before yeah. and and you know when we talk about injury reduction, we talk about the strength and the integrity of that tissue and that joint as well. So what do you think the role of strength training is at this age? And also kind of, you know, if we know there's an increased risk, what kind of advice do you have for, you know, coaches, strength and conditioning coaches, parents on the role of strength training here? Yeah. <laughs> quite a few questions in one um <laughs> very quickly so you mentioned plyometrics to start with our sort of plyometric plan in three sort of sections is pre-peak high velocity we've got loads of variability we let them be kids they jump around and we make it fun as possible during peak high velocity we focus on jumping and landing technique with low stresses on the body as as associated with the injuries and trying to reduce injury risk and then post peak high velocity we look for those performance increases in terms of strength we've got a really good um, sort of foundational movement and functional sort of strength aspect to our program so we get our players regularly performing um, your sort of um, functional movements in terms of squats lunges uh, hip hinges, pushes, pulls, those sort of things from a very young age. So from as soon as they enter the academy at under nines and as soon as a new player will enter as a trialist at whatever age group he comes in, they then have, in the most part, very good um, technique when it comes to peak height velocity. We then have a very individualized approach on top of that in terms of applying additional stimulus so whether that's through um, weights or through changing the tempo of exercises or changing the duration of exercises to then overload players during peak cut velocity and there is some evidence um, coming out from a group in Denmark which has shown some really good indications from using isometric training on growth related injuries such as Osgood's and stuff like that. So uh, Sinead Holden's done some really good work in that area. So if you're interested in how you could train with growth related injuries, that's definitely something to consider. In terms of advice to, to, the, to the average um, parent or coach who's not in an elite setting and wants to provide a physical stimulus to their player or son or daughter, my main recommendation would be 
find a good strength and conditioning coach that has got experience of working with kids, um, mainly because they will understand growth and maturation to some extent, at least, hopefully to a, a large extent, and be able to understand that child's technique and what's the most appropriate training for them at that time. And often what you'll probably see is that there'll be a focus on technique first and then strength will come later down the line, potentially post peak height velocity. If um, they've start to have a low training age or no training age. Um, I feel like there was another part to that question that I've got to. Add yeah, on. No, yeah, no, I think you addressed it really well. Okay. Uh, yeah. You hit on all aspects of it. So um, yeah, David, thanks for taking the time today uh, on LTAD chat shorts um, to kind of cover this topic of the adolescent growth spurt and injury risk. Um, a lot of good information here, you know, not only reviewing your study, but, you know, kind of uh, the other research that's, uh, that's happened and that's going on and best of luck to you as you continue down this, as you continue down this road, um, real valuable area. And I think we'll all, you know, be in, be in tune with what's going on. Um, as we want to keep our young players healthy, performing well, uh, and enjoying and enjoying sport. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for having me on. And um, these are all. I want you to continue still doing this work because it's always really useful and a good resource for me. Anyway, so thanks for that. Yeah, good. Thanks, David.